I struggle with a spouse who does a lot of unloving things to himself. Um, he is very overweight, has every disease involved with being overweight, won't drink water, eats all kinds of meats, and I'm the opposite. And he's angry at me for being that way. And I don't know how to be, how do you be loving in that kind of situation? Do you just accept his choices and go not do anything? Well, I feel like I want to defer to my soulmate because I feel like he's better qualified at being loving <laughs> when someone's harming themselves. But I feel that by, when you can see, you need to be careful though. For, let's say the first thing. Sometimes it's really easy to see the way our partner is not loving themselves or others without first reflecting on how we're not loving ourselves and others. And when we do that and we point the finger of blame at our partner, um, often, and, and we're not looking at ourselves, often they can feel the injustice of that, which creates more resistance in them. So that's probably the first thing that I would look at if I was you. Hang on, am I looking as deeply as, at myself as I am at the problems that he's having? Because if I'm going to start uh, getting, like, talking to him about how he needs to do better to lo even just love himself, is he going to feel that there's a lot of hypocrisy in me because I'm not actually loving him or I'm not actually loving myself? When people don't love themselves and when they like abuse themselves with food and things like that, there's often really deep-seated pain inside of them. And if we are actually going to add to that burden by telling them that they're a bad person for doing that or they need to shape up, or if there's any kind of that emotion coming out of us, it's not going to actually be a loving exchange. It's going to be more harmful. So that's the first thing that I would look at. Beware of hypocrisy. <laughs> um, the second thing I think in principle, and I'm not speaking to your example here because I don't feel that sensitive to exactly what's happening there, but in principle, if you have a partner who's really damaging themselves and you're remaining in that situation, in a way you're complicit with them continuing to harm themselves or others. You know, if you have a partner who is acting out of harmony with love and you are not saying anything about it, after you've checked yourself for your own hypocrisy. But even, even if you're just willing to be shown your own hypocrisy, even if you're willing to just engage it and to hear back from them how you really are, um, to not say anything about it is actually being complicit in that problem. You're actually saying, it's okay, I'm, I'm just going to allow you. Because love, love in action calls us to speak truth, you know, to say, hey, there's a problem here. And if we really love them, I value you. And you're not valuing you. Let's look at why. When I moved in with AJ, I, had, I, I was a terrible housekeeper. Ooh, I was so messy and I didn't want to look after our environment. And I, I would do it, but begrudgingly. And it was like, ugh. Um, and it had been a problem all my life. And especially from a certain period of my teens onwards. Um, and I'd received a lot of feedback about that in the past from parents or boyfriends or flatmates, but it was always very like, come on, you're causing discomfort for me, could you fix this problem? And it never ever resolved. Now, I, it's quite different living in our house, isn't it? I take pride in our house, like, not pride in our house, but I, I like to keep it clean and tidy. I, I feel good about that. I, I take care of a lot of my personal care and the care of our home just naturally without thinking about it. But that change only happened in me because someone who was very loving came to me and said there was no blame within him. He wasn't saying, oh, this is, could you shape up because I don't want to live like this. There was a feeling of like... And literally, he would say to me, babe, come and sit down. I want to talk to you about something. There has to be something inside of you that means that you don't love yourself enough to do these things for yourself. Do you want to talk about that? Let's talk about what's going on for you, really, because I really care about you loving yourself. And that was incredibly powerful for me. It moved me to tears just that somebody actually cared that much about me, not for their own self selfish desires and needs, but because they really, really cared what was happening inside. Because I felt terrible about myself. I couldn't keep my house clean. 
You know, that I've had no self-esteem in me about that. And I'm sure your husband feels similarly in, about himself, you know. It's horrible to feel like you're failing at even maintaining your own body in a healthy state. Um, but it was only when someone was truly loving and compassionate with me that it actually spurred me into really wanting to heal that part of myself. And that's why I, I put the first caveat, which is check yourself for hypocrisy, check yourself for demands and, the sel and selfish desires within, within your desire for him to change, you know, because he'll feel that so strongly. I, I have to say I have been trying um, and, I, and I'm trying. He shuts down. Don't talk to me about this. I don't want to hear it. Yeah. Puts up the wall. Yeah. And I've, I've tried it from other angles, and it's wall. Yeah. So I would look strongly at yourself as well. Um, and then if you feel like you have resolved within yourself, and I don't feel that you have yet, that you are coming from a really loving place, then I would be more firm about I can't support you in this anymore. You know, I can't support you harming yourself because that, that I want, I want to foster you loving yourself, you know, and if I'm supporting you, I'm not fostering that. But did you want to add some, yeah, I knew you would, yeah. <laughs> Is that all right? <laughs> <laughs> um, you're not being very honest with yourself, Pamela. Um, there are lots of times where you want your husband to completely sacrifice himself for you. Right? So in other words, what you're really projecting at him a lot of the times is, I want you to put yourself down and sacrifice yourself for my desires and my will. And then you're giving him this other mixed message, you should also look after yourself. <laughs> now, a person who has to put themselves down for you constantly, sooner or later is not going to feel good about themselves. Now, obviously, he's had this problem probably before he met you. Otherwise, he wouldn't tolerate that feeling coming from you either. Does that make sense? But that's the feeling coming from you towards him, that, that you, he's got to do everything you want him to do, plus look after himself. Now, the two things are actually not uh, harmonious with each other the way that you want them to be. The reason why is because you're causing him to tune away from himself while at the same time asking him to look after himself. Now, if you desire that in a relationship, it's like giving a person a completely mixed message from a soul-based perspective. So it's like me saying to Mary, I want you to do what I want, and, but on top of that, um, so to, to do that, Mary has to put herself down if she has to do everything I want. She has to somehow put herself down, and particularly if my wants are quite selfish, she's going to have to put herself down to do everything I want. In putting herself down, she's not going to feel good about herself. She's not going to be doing the things that she really wants to do for her life. She's going to feel like she's got to be doing a heap of things for me. But in the end, if I then expect her to have good self-esteem afterwards, can you see I'm pulling down, I'm asking her to pull down her self-esteem when she's with me, but to have some self-esteem. It's a, it's a completely mixed message. Now, I see a lot of people in relationships doing this, where, for example, the wife wants the husband to provide her security, her safety, her financial security, her, um, and a number of other, her sexual feeling like she's sexually desired, um, and a lot of other things. But to, to do that, he's got to pull himself down from his own desires in a lot of ways in order to do it. And then when he does that, and he gets a bit chubby and you know, he drinks a bit much and because he's sad, you know, he doesn't feel the same thing coming from his wife, so he feels sad, so he drinks a bit much and maybe takes up smoking and, you know, drinks a bit much and eats a bit much, you know, feeling bad about himself and he gets a bit chubby, she says, you're not looking after yourself either. <laughs> it's like another demand placed upon him. And I suggest to you that um, he's not feeling from you your, any real interest in him as an individual. He's only feeling from you what you want from him. That's all he's feeling from you. And when a, when a person, any person, man or woman, feels that from another, he, will, he or she will automatically go into resistance in the relationship. So in other words, they will purposefully then do what upsets you <laughs> mm. 
because they know it's, it's a passive-aggressive way of disagreement with the other person's behaviour. And so I suggest that your husband is passively, aggressively disagreeing with your behaviour towards him. He's a unwilling... He, he possibly can't even identify what he feels. Many, many, many times men can't. Um, but if you do what Mary said, look at yourself first and examine all the ways and all the expectations and all the demands you've had upon him, not only now, but also all the way through your relationship, right from the beginning of your relationship. And then you see also on top of that the demands that his own mother has placed upon him before you met him, right? Or other women have placed upon him before you met him. And you, you will see probably a history of demand upon, upon demand placed and, and then you will see the reasons why he, in fact, is quite resistive. And then the first thing to do, as Mary pointed out, is firstly deal with all the demands coming out of you. Deal with that first. Once you no longer have any demands coming out of you, then my suggestion would be talk to him about what he must feel about your demands. Because obviously if he's in resistance like that to any discussion about the issue, then he's in some passive aggression. The fact that he's not overtly dumping it on you means that he's not aggressive but the fact that he's causing annoyance to you through his behavior of treatment of himself is a way of him trying to protest against prior behaviors while at the same time trying to maintain some kind of relationship and uh, and the better course of action for him would have been to protest more vigorously <laughs> earlier more in the openly, relationship. Yeah. But if you examine your own feelings about that, you probably would have probably left him under those circumstances. And so, you know, he didn't feel that that was probably an option. And in fact, uh, what I see happening, there are many people who have heard divine truth who come to us and complain that their husbands or wives are not following the principles of divine truth in their life and how can they get their husband or wife to follow the principle of divine truth in their life. The way you get anybody to even listen to anything you've got to say is to love them. <laughs> and any time they don't want to listen to what you've got to say, it's highly likely there is something going on where you don't want or they're not feeling love from you. Now that can be either that, that you have love for them and they don't feel it or that you don't have any love for them and that's what they're feeling. Now, if you, if you think about what Mary's told you already about our relationship, no matter what happened, Mary still knew and could feel that I loved her. She always felt drawn to that place, you know? Yeah, I felt drawn because I could feel, even if I couldn't understand how this could be loving, I could feel there was this really kind feeling coming towards me and that was very compelling. I, I, I felt more accepted in this company than I did anywhere else. And there's more compassion. Mm. Like I always had compassion for both myself and for Mary, the equal compassion for both of us, right? And that's not what your husband's feeling from you. So, so any person generally who puts on a lot of weight, they are generally in quite strong anger. But it's usually passive. In other words, it's not anger that they overtly are sharing with others, but anger that they are internalising. And as a result, weight will just stack on them and eventually they'll get very, very large if they're not careful. And usually that kind of anger, anger that you internalise, um, comes from what you believe is, and not always your beliefs are true, but what you believe is unfair treatment of yourself. And, uh, and that usually occurs over many, many years where there is unfair treatment of yourself. Now, eventually, that anger will come and boil over. So most people who have put on a lot of weight eventually get to a point where they are quite overtly angry with everyone around them, eventually. But in, before that stage, they've had to internalise all of this stuff, all of this anger and resentment that they've had. And what needs to happen is the people around them as these people are putting on weight and as they're getting more and more unhealthy, the people around them have to start questioning how they are supporting this person in their own unhealthy treatment of themselves. And one of the biggest ways you support a person to do that is to demand things of them, emotionally demand things of them that they feel is unfair. Now, just because they feel it's unfair, it doesn't necessarily mean it is. But any demand, of course, is not loving. 
So, so naturally, they're not being loved under those circumstances. And if we look at those things first, then it allows us to work through a lot of these issues. Eventually, people who stack on a lot of weight and, and have those kind of things, eventually they will start being overt with their demands. Because after a while, they get so angry, they go, stuff this. <laughs> right? I'm not putting up with this anymore. You try and tell me another thing about myself, that's it. I don't want to know. Don't talk to me about it anymore. And, and even that is also still really passive because they could be just yelling and screaming at you by that stage, but they're not. And so what I suggest is that the first thing we need to do is look at all the reasons why we do that. Now, a person who feeds themselves too much and drinks too much obviously doesn't love themselves. So the core problem, the real core problem from a grief perspective is going to be a lack of love of self. The question we need to ask ourselves is how have we contributed to their lack of love of self? That's the question. That's the thing we can change. And I notice that even with children, very frequently uh, parents contribute to the lack of love inside of the children for themselves and so the child feels so little love for themselves and their room becomes untidy and everything else becomes you know messy and then the parents nagging them about being messy and untidy and whatever else but but a lot of it began from their lack of love of themselves does that make sense the and parents the par and the parents and the parents that, contribution yeah, yeah. to their lack of love of themselves which is all about the parents demands the parents controls and so forth and so we need to be very when we notice somebody not loving themselves we need to be very self reflective about how we have contributed to that now in my case with mary we met 6 years ago and I noticed firstly Mary's own lack of love of herself and obviously I didn't create it because I hadn't lived with her before then but when we've lived with somebody for 10, 15, 20, 30 years we are a part of the creation of their own lack of love for themselves, their current position and we need to examine why or how that's happened. Does that make sense? So that's I feel what you're skipping over, you're sort of um, you're not allowing yourself to see how your demands upon the relationship and upon him, emotional demands primarily, over a long period of time, and the demands of his mother in particular as well, and before then, um, have contributed to his own lack of love of himself. And now you're just annoyed that he doesn't love himself. Does that make sense? And you want him to fix it and you're just annoyed with him that he doesn't love himself and you can see the problems it's going to cause in the future obviously you know if he becomes more and more unhealthy there's more that you're going to have to do to look after him and in a way that's part of his passive aggressive anger expression of what's happened in the past yeah you know, the more you have to do he can get away with being sick and you have to do more does that make sense and uh, and it is a way of actually cre creating this sort of demand with people Interestingly, there are many diseases on the planet that are caused by almost exactly the same emotion. Cancer is one of them. So cancer is a disease that is caused by this feeling of other people's... a uh, feeling that other people should meet your demands, right? And a feeling that you don't want to look after your own emotional needs and you want other people to look after your own emotional needs. And, it, and where you get the cancer will depend exactly on where you feel these particular emotions. So for, for a woman getting cancer in her left, bre left breast, it's all about her feelings that women should meet her demands. Right? For a woman getting cancer in her right breast, it's all about men meeting her demands. Right? And, uh, and, and often these kind of diseases get created. The passive aggressive rage that we internalise and then of course our own body starts having damage attributed to it due to the passive aggressive rage which is an unloving position so what's happening to your husband now of course is he's putting on weight he's you know potential for disease and potential for diabetes you know the potential for a number of different diseases and these things are part of his now his own way of addressing a long-term issue where he feels he's been treated unfairly for a long period of time by women in particular does that make sense um, so he will have to deal with that at some point if he ever wants to be healthy um, and he ever wants to have a healthy relationship 
but, but the key for you is to see where you've contributed to that through your demands. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I feel that's the thing you're skipping over. You, you want it to be, and we often do this in relationships, we want it to be the other person's problem all the time. Right? <laughs> he's getting fat, it must be his fault. <laughs> Well, he's, it's his body, so it's got to be his fault, right? That's what we think, but we don't see, we don't go, okay, that's caused by somebody who's either eating, drinking too much, it's caused by somebody who obviously um, doesn't have a good sense of self-worth, and if they, if they don't have a good self, sense of self-worth, then you've got to say, well, okay, it's okay, they don't have a good sense of self-worth, but who's lived with them for the majority of their life? And who would have assisted their creation of their lack of self-worth? So obviously, firstly, their parents would have. But then if we've lived with them for 30 years, we, we can't say to ourselves that we haven't been a part of the creation of it because obviously we have. You know, if we've just met them for the first time, it's different. But if we've been with them for a long period of time, then we're a part of the creation. Yeah. Does make sense? Thank you. That light bulb went off in my head. That was great. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. if you allow yourself, you will see a lot of the long-term demands you've had upon him emotionally where he's felt like he's had to do a certain things in order to please you. And if you look at his mum, whom you don't necessarily have a good relationship with yourself, uh, mostly because you're very similar <laughs> in the sense of his, your demands upon your husband, and, uh, and, therefore, uh, and this is what happens with a lot of fighting between mother-in-laws and daughter-in-laws as well. Or a lot of um, what I'd call not fighting, but you know, not not they're not open and free with each other and not loving with each other, and a lot of it is because both mother and and daughter-in-law have the same demands upon the same person, and so the man, you know, in this case, has grown up with those demands. Then he, of course, through his law of attraction, marries a person with those same demands, and then um, and then more demands is placed upon him. Eventually. If he, you know, understood all of that, he would start realising he's just got to deal with some stuff about his mum and so forth and he'd release a lot of stuff and that would help him have some good self-esteem and help him feel better about himself. And, but it, to be frank, he won't put up with as much as your shit either <laughs> if he does that. <laughs> and, uh, and you won't like that very much because you have liked him doing what his mum has liked him doing, even though it's been damaging to him. Does that make sense? So the key is to be self-reflective and allow yourself to feel about that and allow yourself to see that and change it in yourself. Change your demands coming out of you. Truly change them, not, not through your action, but through your emotion by, by re letting go of the emotions that drive those demands. And he will feel that from you. And he'll feel then drawn, just like Mary has felt drawn, back all the time to have more conversation about things. Uh, he'll, she'll, he'll feel drawn to openly converse with you about what he's really feeling and why and things like that. At the moment, he doesn't feel drawn to do that because he knows as soon as he says what he really feels, you're going to not believe him. You're, you're going to say, no, that's not the way it is. And, you know, he knows that, so, so he shuts it all down and just says, I don't want to hear anymore. Don't talk to me about that divine truth crap anymore. I don't want to hear. <laughs> don't talk to me about emotional stuff anymore. I don't want to hear. And, uh, and that's as a result of him now ha having what he feels is the only protection from these demands. Yeah. How many of you ladies have had similar situation in your marriages and now that you reflect? A few of you, yeah. yeah. And a lot of men have the same thing towards their wives, of course. You know, like mm. I'm not saying that it's gender related, it's definitely you know, it can be intergender related. Like, I see a lot, you know, we go to countries like, um, you know, where, where you, countries where ma males are more, still more dominant than females, and man, the, the guys have got huge demands going at their wives. You know, we recently had something to do with places in Africa, and the guys have just got huge demands going towards their wives, and their wives are now angry, resentful, chubby mm. um, people, Passive, in passive aggressive rage, you know, and in the case of one place in Africa, the guys are all just sitting around chatting to each other all day. None of them have jobs. They don't do any work around the house or anything else. And they, and they have the woman cook for them, clean for them, go and get the food for them, go and get the water for them. And, and you know, when you point out to them their unloving behaviour, what they say? 
They say, oh, but all my mates will, uh, will look down on me if I do all that. That's a woman's work, right? So, you know, so it's not, it's not just one gender over another that has demands on the other gender. It's mm. worldwide, there's a big problem with it. Yeah. 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 Mm. Anyway.